No other love so precious, so beautiful and rare. He gave the greatest gift that he could give. He died. I 
am rejoicing, singing his praises. Jesus is mine. Shadows around me, shadows above me, never conceal my Savior and guide. He is a light in him is no darkness. Ever I'm walking close to his side. Heavenly sunlight, heavenly sunlight, flooding my soul with glory divine. Hallelujah, I am rejoicing, singing his praises. Jesus is mine. In the bright sunlight, ever rejoicing, pressing my way into mansions above, singing his praises. Gladly I'm walking, walking in sunlight, sunlight of love. Heavenly sunlight, heavenly sunlight, flooding my soul with glory divine. Hallelujah, I am rejoicing, singing his praises, Jesus is mine. Be with all these people that are traveling in here to see this event tomorrow. Lord, just put it on their hearts while they're looking up. They can see you behind them with this. It's all you. We know you did this, and you got everything in the control. And thank you for that. In your son's name, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Well, it's good to be in the house of the Lord this first Sunday of April. Doesn't seem like we ought to be in April, but we are. So, uh, in our bulletins this morning, uh, the church is going to have its second VBS meeting on Sunday, April the 21st at 5 uh, p.m. Uh, VBS is getting closer and closer, and we still have some decisions and things that we got to make to for it to avail itself. And our theme is scuba, and it's dive into friendship with God. So, you know, we need to uh, start. It's not too uh, early to start promoting it, since it will be right after school is out. So uh, if you need a flyer or something, there's some on the table. Um, and then the church will also have a quarterly business meeting during the Wednesday evening service on April the 24th. So all members are welcome to come and attend that as well. Uh, because if you're interested in what the church is doing or how the church is, is going or, or whatever, well, come to the business meeting and find out. Um, and then we were going we are going to have, the church is going to have a potluck lunch. On after following the Sunday worship service on Sunday, April the 28th, the last Sunday of the month. And of course, there will be more details to follow as it gets, it gets closer. But, you know, I'm trying, we're trying to have something, you know, every month so that we can be able to, to be together and do something. And uh, one of the good ways to do that is to eat. So, you know, do what? One of my favorite things. Yeah. And after all, you know, it is one of our favorite things to do. So uh, I pray that, you know, you come and we're going to eat whatever's brought. So uh, if you're wondering what to bring, well, you can call and I can tell you what I like. <laughs> and you can bring it. But, you know, other than that, we invite anyone listening to come and be a part of that, be a part of our worship service, and then 
eat with us. Uh, there'll be, as always, I'm sure there'll be more than plenty. On the back uh, of our bulletin, there's, uh, you know, we're starting this spring, and spring we start thinking about plants and flowers and how they grow, and, and we buy plants and and all that thing to grow in our homes or whatever. Well, uh, we need to know a little bit about how to grow as being a Christian. And so that's what's on the back of the bulletin. I hope you'll read it and uh, take it to heart this morning. Mm -hmm. Jimmy? For those that are listening, uh, you definitely missed it Friday night because if you've never had a blessing in your life, you need to come to music first Friday of every month and hear one, one accord and the music people that they bring in. It was just, I can't even say, it was just overwhelming. Yeah. It, was, it was just great. It was, it was fantastic. Uh, stay in song. Let's turn to page 208. 208. One, two, and four. Of our loving Lord, grace that exceeds our sin and our guilt. God, your own Calvary's bound up void. There, where the blood of the Lamb was spilled. Grace, grace, God's grace, grace that will pardon and cleanse within. Sins were washed away, and 
spirit with life from above into God's family divine. Justified fully through Calvary's love. Oh, what a standing is mine. And the transaction so quickly was made when as a sinner I came took of the offer of grace he did proffer he saved me oh praise his dear name heaven came down and glory filled my soul when at the cross the Savior
you know, no matter what's facing you this morning, what kind of problem you're having, this is a place to be. We learned in our Sunday school lesson this morning that we're in a battle every day. Jesus says we will win the war because one day He's coming back. As long as we stay focused on Him, He's going to take us home. So I ask you this morning just to open your hearts and ears to what the Lord is laying on the one side. Good morning. Back before Easter, I think it was uh, uh, the week before the triumphal entry uh, we uh, were in the book of Acts in chapter 1 and we were in verses 3 through uh, 14 is our text and uh, we were in this thing and, and we have to realize that you know for the disciples the past month and a half that they had been they had been in a whirlwind of time for them. Forty days earlier they had seen the Lord Jesus die on the cross. On that day all their dreams and their hopes came crashing to the ground. They hid themselves away in fear of suffering the same fate that Jesus had experienced. But three days after he died, he was resurrected. We know that is Resurrection Sunday. And he appeared to them alive again. And their Lord has risen from the dead and there was hope. And still we find they wake. They were up and they were down. You know, it's kind of like the believers of the day. The church of today, it's up and it's down and, and, and things. The Lord took them during these days and He began to teach them some truths that they desperately needed. And He was going away, He tells them in verse 3, and, and He's leaving His work, His ministry in their hands. They needed to know what the Lord expected of them. And He taught them. They needed to know what they were to be doing. And the Lord taught them. They needed comfort for their troubled hearts and He gave it to them. He spent 40 days with His men instructing them, comforting them, and spending time with them. Now comes the day as we go back to our text. Verse 3 says, and uh, if you'll turn, find Acts 1 in your Bibles and stand with me as we read our text this morning where we'll, we're going to continue out of. It says, verse 3, to whom also he showed himself alive after his passion by many infallible proofs being seen of them forty days. And speaking of things pertaining to the kingdom of God and being assembled together with them, commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem but wait for the promise of the Father, which saith he, ye have heard of me. For John truly baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. And they therefore were come together, and they asked of him, saying, Lord, wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? And he said unto them, it's not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father hath put in His own power, but ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. Ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and to Judea and to Samaria and the, unto the uttermost parts of the earth. And when He had spoken these things while they beheld, He was taken up, and a cloud received Him out of their sight. And, they, and while they looked steadfastly toward the heaven, as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, which also said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? 
This same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner as ye have seen Him go up into the heaven. They return. Then return they into Jerusalem from the Mount of Olives, which is from Jerusalem a Sabbath day's journey. And when they came in, they went up into the upper room and where abode both Peter and James and John and Andrew, Philip, Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James the son of, of Alphaeus and Simon uh, Zelotus and Judas the brother of James. These all continued with one accord in prayer and supplication with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with His brethren. Let us pray, Lord, we do come thanking You, Lord, for Your many blessings You bestowed upon us. Lord, we pray now that as we continue uh, here in uh, the first chapter of the book of Acts, Lord, that You would open our hearts to be receptive to what Your Word and the implications of it have to speak to us. And we'll give You praise and honor and glory for it. For it's with that that each one standing said, Amen. We can be seated this morning now. Uh, there have been some 40 days that have gone by after the resurrection of Jesus. And here in those 40 days, we Scripture tells us that He he has come and He's gone and, and He's come and He's teaching them and relaying to them what they should be doing. And now, they're on the Mount of Olives with Jesus and He tells them to stay here in Jerusalem. And uh, then they were to stay to wait on the power of what God would send them as He sends them the Holy Ghost. And then we find Jesus is taken up into the clouds and they're standing there with their probably with their jaws wide open looking up and they find two men standing by them in white apparel. And they asked him a question. What stand ye here gazing into the heavens? This same Jesus that you see going up will one day be coming down. So they, they turned and uh, for one day it was a, a compelling departure there that we find in, in chapter 9 and or in verse 9 and, and we wonder why just why Jesus had to leave. Why He had to go back into heaven to His heavenly home. Well, we find that there were at least three reasons why Jesus had to go to heaven while His men stayed there. Now, we're getting caught up to where we're going to take off again. So, we know that one reason that they... that he had to leave, they had to stay, was that if Jesus had not gone away, the Spirit of God would not have come. Now, we're talking, so we see that this is a God plan thing. That the plan of God required not only that He came on one, son, on one Christmas born, that He died on one good Friday that He arose again on that first Easter Sunday morning, but that now He had to leave so that the Holy Spirit, that same One that Jesus spoke of in John chapter 16, as he called him the Comforter. 
to be able for the comforter, the Holy Spirit, to be able to come, Jesus had to go. These men, that the reason, and when Jesus leaves and the Holy Spirit comes, these same men that had been walking by sight as they followed Jesus would now learn to walk by faith as He has gone from them. This same Holy Spirit of God will be in them to empower them for service. We go back to verse 8. It says, uh, But ye shall receive power when? After the Holy Spirit has come. Not before, but after. So that was one reason. The second reason Jesus had to go to heaven was to be able to make intercession for them. When He ascended back into heaven, Jesus took His rightful place as He sat on the right hand of His Father, according to Hebrews chapter 1, verse 3. I can't explain how it all works. But we do know that He sits at the throne of God interceding on not only the disciples' behalf, but on our behalf as well. Third. Jesus went to heaven so that He could return for His people someday. You know, we were, we were taught that He's going to come. Amen. Many here are looking for Him to come for the first time. Those of us who are like the disciples now are walking by faith. We're, we're walking in that blessed hope that He's coming again. Amen. One day. He promised there in John chapter 14 and verse 3 that He would return for His people. And the angels that are present with the disciples now at the ascension reaffirm that promise in verse 9 and 10. And as the Scripture closes, you know, His promise is repeated again. In Revelation 22 and verse 20, for because in that verse he says, Surely I come quickly. Surely I come quickly. All we as believers have been known, have ever known, is that Jesus is not here physically. But I want to remind you that while he is not here with us, he is physically present in heaven. And one day, one day, He will return for His people to take them to Him. But we find that, you know, there was one element that occupied the minds of the disciples that day. And it was the ascension of Jesus into the glory of heaven and into the presence of His Father. And we would do well to meditate on His ascension and rejoice in what it means for you and me one day. So it was a compelling departure we pick up. We also must see that it was a confusing future. Now everything that the disciples had ever known, they had ever learned, was because Jesus was physically there with them. And when Jesus gone away, the disciples are concerned about what the future holds. Both for them and for the work of the Lord. They ask Jesus about the future and about when they can expect Him to establish the kingdom of God. They want to know if the time has come or if they must wait. 
But we find that the answer the Lord gives him is anything but clear. He tells him essentially that such matters are not their business. But they belong to the secret, providential workings of the Lord. Deuteronomy 29, 29 says the secret things belong unto the Lord our God. Look at back in our text in verse 6 and 7. It says, When they therefore were come together, they asked of Him, asking, Lord, wilt Thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? Verse 7, And He said unto them, It's not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father had put in His own power. Literally, it's none of your business. you got some business that lies ahead of you, disciples, believers, the faithful. You have some things that have been set aside for you to do. But you're not going to you're not going to be able to do them. You're not going to be able to understand them until until that Holy Spirit of God falls on man. And then then you will have power to do the things that I've been telling you that you're going to have to do. You know, the future is a very secret thing which Man is prevented from knowing. No so-called psychic, medium, soothsayer, or prophet can tell you what will happen tomorrow. No one but God knows what the future holds or when Jesus will come for His people. Anyone who says different is a liar. He's, he's nothing but deceiving you. While no human may know what the future holds, we do know who holds the future. Our Father stands outside of time. He transcends the very boundaries of time and space. And what He cannot see while we cannot see the future, the Lord is already in all of our tomorrows. He's already been there. He has prepared our way. He has ordered our steps. Now isn't that a comforting thought? Our world is filled with pain, sorrow, heartache. None of us knows whether tomorrow will be better or worse than today. Regardless of what the path of life holds for us, our Father not only walks with us, He also walks ahead of us to secure our future. Tomorrow is a confusing thing to us mortal people. We are so confused about tomorrow. After all, we're not even promised that it will be here. According to Proverbs 27 and verse 1. Today we are here. Tomorrow we may be in eternity. Who knows? I did a, a funeral service on Friday. That it, it, even though he was 95, nobody expected him to go home with the Lord on the Saturday before Easter. While we were celebrating having a picnic, heaven was having a celebration.
Today, the fair winds may be blowing around us. Tomorrow, we may find us in the storms of our lives. And while the future may be shrouded in mystery, as far as we were concerned, we have the Lord's assurance that He is already there. And that He has the future well in hand. See, the disciples, now, they had to learn that all that they had been given as Jesus walked with them and talked with them and taught them, they were living by sight. Because He was there. They could see what He was doing. And everything that He was doing was for their benefit. Because the same power, basically, that was in Him and enabling Him to do what He could do is the same power that was coming unto them. That same resurrection power. And it comes in the form of the Holy Ghost. The Holy Spirit. The disciples were concerned about the future. But they didn't need to be. The Father had the future well at hand. Are we concerned? Are you concerned about tomorrow? About the things of tomorrow? Do worries, fears, and doubts about tomorrow, do they trouble you? And if they do, you have no need to be worried or afraid. Your Father already has taken care of all of your tomorrows. Now, does it mean that we're not going to face anything in our tomorrow? Sure we are. Because the Bible tells us we are. But what we've got to realize is that we now have that same power that fell down on the disciples, that fell down upon believers here in chapter 2 in the book of Acts. We now have that same resurrection power living in us that enables us to walk not by sight, but by faith in the Lord Jesus. It's a challenging task. Go back to verse 4 and verse 5. It says, And being assembled together with them, commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which saith He, Ye have heard of Me. For John truly baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost. Not many days hence. So Jesus is basically telling them, you've got to stay here in Jerusalem. Because in not many days, the very Holy Spirit of God that I've been telling you about is going to fall down on believers. It's going to rain down on believers. The fire is going to come unto believers. And you've got to be here. You've got to be ready for it. You know, they were given an assignment there in verse 8. They were to, to take the gospel message, the truth of the gospel, Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the uttermost parts of the earth. That same direction, that same marching orders is our marching orders. Now, it may not be Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria and the uttermost parts. But it could be 
Mesquite, Dallas County, Texas, and the uttermost parts of the world. It could be our homes, our city, and our county. It could even be our home, our children, and their children. No matter how we we take it, we got our marching orders. The disciples had their marching orders. Don't you lose. Don't you lose. Don't you leave Jerusalem. Because it's coming. It's coming. They were tasked with sharing the gospel with all people in all places. Their mandate was to preach the gospel to every creature. Mark. 16 verse 15. They were to go and to teach all nations. Matthew 28 verse 19. These men had a message to tell and the Lord sent them out to tell them. Their assignment must have been front and center in their minds as they watched Jesus depart from them and disappear into the glory cloud. For the last three years, these disciples had watched the Lord Jesus do what He was what He was sending them out to do. They had heard Him preach the gospel, watched Him love the lost, and seen uh, and seen Him cross all social and religious barriers to reach sinners. He had used them too. He had sent them out to preach, but they had always been there when they went out and when they came back. He was always there. Now He's going away and they're being left behind without Him. Surely the task they faced filled them with fear. How would they do it without Him? How will they accomplish God's work if He is not there to help them? The trouble is, He was there to help them because He gave them the Holy Spirit, the promise of God. The very promise of God is that if Jesus departed from them, He would send the Comforter. In this text, Jesus reminds them that even though He's going away, He's not leaving them to do this task alone. There in verse 5, Jesus promises them that they will be baptized with the Holy Ghost. Not many days hence. And that promise was literally fulfilled ten days later on the day of Pentecost. When the Spirit of God came in power to Fill the church with His presence. You know, there's still days the Lord fills His church with His presence. The night before He died, Jesus had promised His men that He would send them someone to help. Jesus said this in John 14, verse 16 through 18, And I will pray the Father, and He shall give you another comforter, that He may abide with you forever. Even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth Him not, neither knoweth Him, but ye know Him, for He dwelleth with you, and shall be in you. I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. So now what they're getting, they're getting the very promise that the very power of God, very we find now that Jesus is ascended into heaven, taking His place at the rightful side, on the right side of God, 
to form and to provide intercession daily on their behalf, not only in that, but now that Jesus had gone up, gone away, we find that this same Jesus was going to be sent to them in the, in the form of the Comforter, of the Holy Spirit. So they would not be left lonely or lonesome in doing what they had to do. They would still have the power of the Lord. Verse 8, Jesus tells the disciples that the Holy Ghost will empower them to carry out the mission of God is leaving here to do. They will not have to do God's work alone. They are promised His power, His touch, His blessing as they carry the Gospel to the ends of the earth. And I'm telling you today that that same power, that same blessing falls upon the very church, the very heart of born again believers today. And by that, if we will do His bid, if we will do what He wants us to do, and that is to take the Gospel to a lost and dying world, His blessings, His uh, uh, providings, the things of God will fall on His church. We are still here. And God has not changed His mind. Do you know why you, why you are still in this world? You are here because the Lord isn't through with you yet. One reason He leaves us here in this world with all of its sin, all of its problem, all of its pain is so that we might be witnesses to His saving grace to a world that is trapped in sin. He leaves you here so that the world might see Jesus yeah. in you. So that you might tell the lost about the Christ who can save them. Second yeah. Corinthians 3, verse 2 and 3, Ye are our epistle written in our hearts, known and read of all men. For as much as you are manifestly declared to be the epistle of Christ, ministered by us, written not with ink, but with the Spirit of the living God. Not in tablets of stone, but in fleshly tablets of the heart. For we are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good work, which God had before ordained that we should walk in them. Ephesians 2, verse 10. 2 Corinthians 3 says that we are epistles. That is, we are God's letters of love and grace to a lost world. When they read our life, they should be reading of His love and His mercy, His grace, and His saving power. Yeah. Ephesians 2 and verse 10 says that we are God's workmanship. And that word comes from the Greek word and gives us our English word of poem. It refers to an artist's master work. In short, we are examples to the world of what God can do when He saves a soul. We look and we wonder, what am I supposed to be doing? That's what we're supposed to be doing. The disciples are wondering, well, are, are you going to do your kid? Man, that's not for you to worry about. The only thing you've got to worry about is the task that I have left for you. 
Let God, let the Father worry about when the kingdom's coming. For you and I, it's the same way. We're not to be worried. Now, we hope because our blessed hope lies in the very fact that we'll get to see Him again one day. That we will be with Him for all eternity. That there will come a day when the bridegroom will come to collect His bride for Himself. Okay, fine. But we have no idea when that takes place. But until that day takes place, we are given marching orders. We are to share with the world what literally Christ has done for us. So that's why we should live for Him and why we should always be ready to share the Gospel with a lost world. 1 Peter 3, verse 15, But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. We need to be ready to always tell somebody when they ask, how can you be so cheerful? Look at what you're going through. How do you understand that? How, how come you're, you're always this way? Look at what's going on. Look at the world around you and you're sitting here thinking, you know, you're telling us that there are better days to come. Because we can. Because we have right residing with us in our hearts the Comforter. Because we know that one day it's all going to be over. And we're going to be out of here. Because this world is not our home. We're just passing through this place. But until that day comes, we need to keep passing. We need to keep going. We need to keep proclaiming the Lord Jesus. I'm sure the task laid upon them occupied the minds of the disciples that day. I fear, however, that the task rarely crosses our minds today. We have the same assignment. May the Lord help us to be about our Father's business. Just as they were to be about their Father's business. Same Father. Same business. Just different time in time. We find a comforting promise. Look at verse 10 and 11. It says, And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, which also said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall come in like manner, as ye have seen him go into heaven. The minds of the disciples, they are filled with many thoughts on this day. They've been given an assignment that far exceeds their abilities. They face a future that is unknown and probably a little more than frightening to them, I would imagine. And to top it all off, they just watch as their Savior, their Lord, the One they have left everything behind to follow disappear into a cloud of glory. They are terrified, filled with many questions about today and about all that tomorrow will lie ahead. They are so captivated by the sight of Jesus going into heaven that they are obvious they, they were oblivious to the two strangers who stand among them. These men turn out to be angels and they speak words of comfort to these confused, bewildered, scared disciples. 
The angels tell them, this same Jesus, which is taken up for you into heaven, shall so come in like manner as you've seen Him go. And they say, yes, He has gone away. But there is no use staring into heaven with a sense of confused bewilderment. Jesus has gone away, but He's coming again. You may see it, and you may not, but He is coming. The implication is clear. These angels tell them to be about the business of the Lord, knowing that they work for Him, they serve Him. There is coming a day when He will return. You know, I've already referenced it, but it is the same assurance that we live under today. And while the future unfolds around us with all of its uncertainties, with all of its questions, and while our lives are occupied with serving Him, we have the blessed confidence that Jesus is coming again to claim His people. It's the same promise that Jesus gave us in John 14, 1 through 3. First Thessalonians chapter 4, 16 through 18. First Corinthians 15, verse 51 through 52. That one day Jesus is coming for you. And he will take you home to live with him forever in heaven. The blessed hope will become more than hope. It will become a reality. That's why Paul referred to the Lord's coming as the blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God of our Savior, Jesus Christ. No matter what today holds or what tomorrow brings your way, rest in the knowledge that Jesus is coming. And if you will know Him as your Savior on that day, it will be that day will be a day of wonder, blessing, and glory. So I ask you today, after all that we've seen, all that we have read, all the implications that uh, God is giving us, what are we looking at today? What has your attention today? What are you occupied with today? Are you caught up in the wonder of a risen Savior who loves you, who gave Himself for you on the cross at Calvary? I mean, after all, last Sunday was Resurrection Sunday and churches were full of people. And now we come after that day. And look at our churches today, maybe. Are we caught up in the wonder of this risen Savior? The one who loves you, gave himself for you on the cross at Calvary. If you are caught up in Jesus and his glory, that's a wonderful thing. It means you're saved. You will be ready to meet Jesus when he does come again. Are you confused about what life, uh, uh, about the turns that life has taken? Are you worried about the future and, and what it holds for you? If you're worried about today or tomorrow, I challenge you to leave that into the hands of the Lord. He has your today. And He has all of your tomorrows well in hand. Bring your fears to Him. Let Him comfort your heart. Are you actively serving the Lord? and doing the work of sharing the Gospel. Well, He has called you too. And if you are serving the Lord and sharing with Him with the lost, carry on. 
Keep going. Occupy until the day comes. One day He is coming. And He will reward you for your faithful service unto Him. Are you looking for His coming? Are you even ready for His return? If you're looking for Him, don't stop. Because friends, He's coming. same Jesus that rose up into the heavens on the day of the of ascension is the same Jesus that will come again in the clouds as the bridegroom to take his bride home. And finally come to pass for the one that they followed so long was leaving them at last with their hearts filled sorrow, they watched him ascend. And the angel said, the one you see here is coming, coming back, back again. again. He's coming. This same, same Jesus, the same Jesus that left that day will come again. The same Jesus. See, we got to realize the angels told them the same Jesus will come again. The same Jesus that came on Christmas morning. The same Jesus that walked in this world for some three and a half years. The same Jesus that hung on Calvary's cross. The same Jesus that resurrected on that very first Easter Sunday morning is coming. He's coming again. We got to be ready for him. God's only son who died in Calvary. This same Jesus. same Jesus is coming. He's coming for you and me. The redeemed, the blood bought, the faithful, born again believer. Just imagine what that day would be like. When that same Jesus is going to come again. He's coming, folks. He's coming. But until then, until then, we got a job to do. And that's to take the gospel to a lost and dying world out there. Out from these walls of this place. Out there. We got to proclaim Jesus. Is everybody going to like it? No. 
Are there going to be people that are going to hate us for it? Sure. But those same people are going to hate us for whatever. We're too short, we're too tall, we're too big, we're too small. So what? What we're doing is what Jesus wants us to do. And that's all that matters. Because one day soon, this same Jesus is coming back again. We got to be ready. We got to stand faithful before Him. Let's all stand. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank You, Lord, that You give us the liberty to do the things that we can that need to be done. Lord, You give us the liberty of, of stopping in, in one day and picking up in the next. And yet, Lord, we, the, the, the topic of the subject is You. Lord, I pray now that You'd help us just as You helped those disciples in when those, those two were standing there in that white raiment. And they said, what are, you, what are you looking at? He's coming again. But until then, until that day, we got a job to do. We've received our marching orders. We have our directive and that's to try to take the glory of the Gospel to a lost world outside of the walls of this sanctuary. And we don't need to worry about tomorrow because we've been given the power of the Comforter. Jesus stands in our tomorrows. So there's no need to worry. thing that we need to be wondering about, the thing we need to be searching our hearts about today, no matter whether you're in this sanctuary or you're watching on YouTube, we got we got to we have to literally understand the implications of that day. The Holy Spirit will come upon us just as it, as it has for every born again believer, that same resurrection power will come unto us and it will give us that boldness to stand even though Satan is throwing dart after dart after dart at us. We just need to put on that gospel armor and stand and proclaim Jesus. Lord, I ask today. Lord, that what we have taken, that You would have, or what we've been given, that You would absorb it into our hearts today. And Lord, that You would use it in a mighty way, Lord, to help us to be disciples of You to a lost and dying world out there. Lord, use this invitation. Lord, to, to, to work on our hearts. And as You do, Lord, Lord, I pray that You would forever instill this truth into us. Tis the grandest thing to the ages run. Tis the grandest thing for a mortal tongue. Tis the grandest thing that the world e'er sung. Our God is a to deliver thee. He is a oh, to deliver thee. He is a Thank you.
came in the earth for man is the grandest thing for a mortal strength. Tis the grandest thing that the world has and our God is able to deliver thee. He is able to deliver thee. He is able to deliver thee. Go by sin oppressed, go to him for rest. Our God is able to deliver thee. Pray this morning that as we continued with these same thoughts with Easter as it has failed in the middle of this that we gain from His Word. And what we gain would be that that would shine in our hearts. And as it shines in our hearts, we would be able to give that same message, same thoughts, same to a lost and a dying world out there. This evening we're gonna be, we'll be back. I believe I got it picked out where we're going next, but uh, it's gonna we're gonna still be searching and, and learning in and through the word of God. I hope that uh, everyone is listening will either avail theirself or will avail to watch on YouTube the message of this evening as well. Uh, we love you. We thank you. God loves you. God wants to empower you today if we'll just let Him. So let's pray and we can be dismissed this morning. Lord, we do come thanking you, Lord, for your very... Uh, message that you give us, Lord. Lord, we thank you for uh, opening our hearts to be receptive to it. And Lord, I pray now that as as uh, we have been receptive, Lord, that you would just uh, use it in a mighty way, Lord, to just speak to us as only you can. Lord, we love you. We thank you, Lord, for your many blessings. And it's in the name of Jesus that we do pray. Amen. Amen.